key terms, pronatalist and antinatalist policies. China is not the only country in the world that has an antinatalist policy, though it is the one that's most commonly studied. Um, but some other examples of countries with antinatalist policies. Uh, India uh, also has the, the, the same problems that China has, burgeoning overpopulation, strain on resources, strain on shelter, strain on health care. Um, but uh, a, a less known example of a country with an antinatalist policy uh, down here uh, is Iran. Uh, a pronatalist policy, um, when a government tries to encourage people to have children, is here. Estonia, but also Sweden. Now, before we look at those in a bit more detail, it is very, very important indeed that you have a clear understanding of the demographic transition model. Shows a number of things, key things to understand. Stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. These are all stages of a country's development. So at stage one, the country is an LEDC, very, very poor, most, mostly farming, mostly primary industry, very few factories, certainly very few tertiary industries. And then as a country develops and gets richer, it moves through the stages. Stage four here is where the UK is right now. Don't worry too much about stage five. They are possible projections for the future. So really, really poor stage one, most developed countries in the world, stage four. And for each stage, it shows you what the changes are in the birth and death rates. So stage one, birth and death rates, very, very high. Um, they, they fluctuate a little bit, but they stay very high. Why are there high birth rates? Why are there high death rates? Been through this before, high birth rates, lack of contraception, um, uh, different cultural expectations, for instance, high death rates because there's poor health care, lots of disease, poor diet. But as a country develops into stage two, things start to happen. Birth rate still stays relatively high, but the death rate starts to drop off quite significantly as health care improves. And because of that, the total population, this line here, also starts to rise. Stage three, starting to get even more developed, the birth rate again starts to fall, the death rate starts to level out. The birth rate starts to fall because contraception has improved, um, uh, education and family planning has improved, and the role of women um, has, has changed within the society. And then we get to stage four, which is where we are now. Population starts to grow, but also starts to level off. Birth rates are low, death rates are also low. So expect to have a question about the, the, uh, the DTM in an exam. In fact, I can tell you right now that in your, certainly if you're in year 10, you will have a question about this in your exam in May. Year 11, you probably will as well. So make sure you know the key points of it. So back to pronatalist and antinatalist policies, possible reasons for each one. Well, antinatalist policies, what are the reasons for those? We've been through all this with China. Uh, there's, a, uh, th th there's pressure on um, uh, homes, there's pressure on health care, there's pressure on benefits, there's pressure on education, uh, there's overcrowding in urban areas. All these are reasons why people need... Uh, Government, sorry, need to uh, take up antinatalist policies. Pronatalist policies, on the other hand, why would a country encourage people to have more children? Take Japan, for instance. There's too many old people in the population. Not enough people working, not enough people paying tax, therefore not enough money to support those old people in their care homes, with their pensions, with their benefits. So... Uh, a lot of countries will encourage people to have children so that in, in, in a long-term plan, in 20 years' time, there's going to be a bigger workforce paying taxes. Um, so we've got a very key, important 
uh, key term here as well, geographical vocabulary, fertility rate. This may well come up in an exam. Um, fertility rate is simply the average number of babies uh, per woman in a population. Um, so in an LEDC, a country in stage one of the DTM, for instance, the fertility rate, the average number of babies per woman is going to be much higher than a country in stage four. So our two examples then, Estonia, pro-natalist policies, Iran, anti-natalist policies. How do they encourage these policies? How do they get people in their country to follow the rules? Um, Estonia basically gives a lot of money to women to have children. For instance, 15 months fully paid maternity leave by law here in Britain. Uh, it's six months paid maternity leave after six months um, I think you then get your wages cut, maybe 50% of your normal wages. It's different in different countries. Um, even uh, if you don't have a job in Estonia, uh, the government will give you $200 a month uh, to encourage you to have a baby. It's called a mother's salary. In Iran, uh, there are various different things that they've done. They've made all contraception free. Iran is a Muslim country, uh, so the, the whole idea and process of contraception can be quite a difficult one for the government to balance with the, the, its, its religious responsibilities, but it's managed to get um, religious leaders on side to en encourage the population that family planning is a good thing. Uh, you're not allowed to have children after the age of 35, um, you have to wait three or four years between having children and all of these are enforced by law same as in China bribes and punishments if you don't stick to the rules um, and that's it really for pro and anti-natalist just another couple of examples of countries that do it and another couple of examples of how they do it